It sounds good. You push okay. the button. Thanks, everyone. Right. I'm sorry. Thank well, you. I want to make this even shorter. Uh, we're honored to have uh, Professor Vanessa Perry uh, talk on the issue of uh, housing finance and social equity. Uh, Vanessa is a professor at GW and has written extensively on this topic. Uh, Vanessa, all yours. Thank you so much. And I feel a little misled. Someone told me I was going to be here for the Zoom show re Redux, <laughs> and I don't see any toys, and I don't see any kids flipping around. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I'll work with what we have. Delighted to be here. I'm delighted to visit MIT for the first time. Please, no one give me any equations to try to solve uh, before I leave. That's for you all, not for me. Uh, but again, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Golding and I are good friends. We go way back. Uh, he hired me a number of times, um, first of which was at Freddie Mac back in, uh, let's just say the early 90s and rounded off uh, and uh, several times since then uh, and still speaks to me. So um, it's great to be in his company. I also want to say kudos for offering this course. Um, I looked at the syllabus and it really looks like uh, an exciting, exciting uh, set of work. So I'd like to start off just by telling you a little bit about why I came to studying uh, issues related to uh, equity or in particular inequity uh, and, and black home ownership. So this is a picture of Edenbourne Cemetery in McClellan Town, Pennsylvania which is where my mother's family uh, grew up. It's where my grandparents are buried here. I have a number of other relatives that are buried here. And if you look closely, you see this you know, really nice, well manicured cemetery on one side. And then it's, the cemetery is divided by a white picket fence. And on the other side of the picket fence, it's sort of, uh, messy, less organized, misshapen headstones, grass hasn't been cut, they're weeds. So this side is the side where the black people are buried. And the manicured side is the side where the white people are buried. It's the same, it's owned by the same company. It's been owned by the same company for, I think since its inception. And this is the way things were actually uh, until the 50s, about 90% of all public cemeteries were um, uh, had some sort of racial restrictions. So as a child, we would go and we would be, uh, you know, the cousins and I, we would all have to go and sort of manic deal with this uh, cemetery. And the families would take turns and they would cut the grass and they would plant flowers and pull weeds and all of that. And I remember being pretty little thinking, why do we have to do this? I don't see anybody on the other side pulling any weeds. In fact, it looks nice. Why does this look this way? Why is this like this? And I got a pretty standard answer from my parents. Look, this is just the way things are. So pull the weeds and deal with it. So I think that from that point on, uh, I was always curious about these divisions in our society and why they were in place and why they remain in place. Well, of course, now, you know, there's no actual restriction uh, based on race on where people are buried, but they're certainly not going to move people and mix them up. And, you know, when my, uh, remaining relatives pass away and they decide that they want to be buried, where do you think they're going to want to be buried? They're going to be wanting, want to be buried on the side where the rest of their family is. So this reminds me of kind of where we are in the housing market. You know, there's this legacy that started out, you know, super wrong. And so even in our efforts to try to correct it, what are we going to do? You know, we, we still live in a very segregated and divided society, and it's hard to undo that since this has been put in place. Sorry to be so morbid. Start out with the cemetery, whatever. 
I'm going to be cremated. Uh, so I'm hoping today to share a little bit about the racial wealth and home ownership gaps, talk about redlining and racial discrimination in the housing market, both then and now. I'm gonna hone in on the three C's of mortgage underwriting. The three C's are known as um, cash or capacity, credit and collateral, and they roughly correspond to the key factors that are used to evaluate credit risk. I'll talk about some of the potential solutions that are going on in the policy space right now with respect to these three C's. And hopefully throughout this, we can discuss. I don't wanna just hear myself talk. Uh, you don't wanna just hear me talk as well. So if you have a comment or question, please feel free uh, at any point to, to stop me. Well, let's see if I can get this to work. So there are real issues going on in this market all the time. Now, am I gonna be able to get sound? Let's see here. How do I do this? I thought I had sound, but maybe not. No, no sound. All right, so, huh. all right, so maybe not. You'll have this available to you and you can go back and look at this. Basically, um, I have two examples here of so recent discrimination cases filed against you know, one of uh, two mortgage companies, one Trident outside of the Philadelphia area and the other is of Wells Fargo. Um, in a case that started out in, around, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And I brought these examples, and these are just news clips that kind of summarize the facts of the case. But the point is that, you know, to this day, there are examples of violations of our uh, fair housing laws, both the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit o Opportunity Act, uh, and others. And these cases are you know, often settled. Banks pay you know, hundred millions of dollars. They usually end up committing to more lending in minority communities or some such settlement. And then they kind of go back to, they kind of go back to square one um, and the next case comes up. Well, why do we care about home ownership and access to mortgage credit in the first place? Well, we know that home ownership is sort of the key component in a family's wealth portfolio, such as it is. It's the, it's the difference between you know, a family being able to sort of move forward and transfer wealth intergenerationally uh, and not. And look at these disparities. They're sort of unbelievable. These are in thousands of dollars. Uh, so as of, I think this was at the end of 2019, um, white non-Hispanic households had a median net worth of $953,000. Uh, for black non-Hispanic households, this was 141,000. It's like a 10 time scale, 10 different, uh, 10, you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> 10 times higher. And this has been the same pretty much uh, over time, even though in recent years, since the financial crisis, you can see that the gap has gotten even more wide, even more substantial. We know that a lot of this is explained by the racial homeownership gap. Well, you've seen these numbers before, but it's always sort of fun and interesting to kind of go back and see, one, how little the home ownership rates have changed over time, and two, how stable the gap has been over time, with white households having a home ownership rate of about 75% and Black households being somewhere um, around 45%, even though I think 45% might be close to the maximum it's ever been. And 
uh, this rate is actually lower than it was the 1968 passage of the Fair Housing Act. So the home ownership issue is a wealth issue and really has profound implications for our entire economy. So that's why we, we care about this. People often think or assume that the racial home ownership gap is a story about income disparities. And to a certain extent, we know that that's true. You know, the incomes of, of black and Latino households are significantly lower than they are for white households. And that actually is the case even controlling for type of occupation, time and occupation, et cetera. Uh, but this is a story that isn't just about income. It really is about intergenerational wealth transfers and access to financial services, credit in particular. So if you look at this, you can see that there is a significant home ownership gap, even in the uh, over 120% of local area median category. So this gap, these gaps are not just about income uh, in the current time, but they have more to do with the accumulation of assets over time. There's also some other kind of weird stuff going on. The black white home ownership gap is higher in more segregated areas. So we have here a dissimilarity index in the sort of yellowish line. And then we have um, the black white home ownership gap with the bright green bars. And if you look, you can see that in the areas where there's some exceptions, but in general, um, the areas that are most segregated by race, most highly segregated, also have the highest home ownership gap. Why is that? Somebody answer, I'm gonna have to call on Ed. Why would that be? I can give it a shot. Um, uh, I'm guessing that it's historic factors in the area. So either redlining perhaps from the past that prevented black homeowners from buying homes in the area or other types of race related restrictions that are having in place today. I'm done. It's an excellent answer. Class over, class dismissed. Uh, no, thank you. Yes, please wait for the mic. Thank you. Um, because I think the financial institution gives the safe factors and the power factors to the uh, to elevate the uh, owner of the home value. So maybe the guy, if gives the same uh, factors, the guy will to become increase and the bigger. Mm -hmm. So the financial institutions uh, and their practices are kind of behind this by sort of continuing to preserve the sort of neighborhood segregation that was in place and in place because of the red line. Makes sense. I just show this and these cities, by the way, are the cities that have the highest, the, the metropolitan areas with the highest concentrations of black residents. I just think it's interesting because, you know, it goes to show that there, uh, again, there is a connection between what's happened in the past and what we see now. Uh, and the racial segregation persists, and we'll talk a little bit later about why that matters. Here's another sort of interesting yet complicated chart, uh, probably exceedingly complicated. So here in the green line, we have a housing opportunity index, which basically is an index that tells you um, what percentage of households in an area at median income could afford the median home. So it's an index of, of kind of affordability. And you have um, here the average black home, home ownership, you have the black home ownership rate, again, in some of these same areas that have high concentrations of black residents. And then you have um, the black white home ownership gap. 
And uh, what you see is that the gap is greatest in the most affordable areas. Why is that? <laughs> Ed, you're getting your steps today. Uh, one guess I have is that because credit availability is low and housing values are low, um, those affordable areas essentially have a cutoff where you cannot you cannot access home ownership tools like mortgages uh, in some of the most affordable cities. It's not there's a limited availability of mortgage credit. So we have um, a secondary market whose one of their purposes is to make sure that there's mortgage credits sort of widely available and not dependent on sort of local area as sort of economic factors. That said, secondary market certainly doesn't work perfectly. Uh, and we do see differences in requirements um, that vary by area. This very well, in you know, my view, anyone else? Before I give you my hypothesis, so way back there. Actually, just a question coming in on line one. I want to know where you can find this homeownership opportunity index uh, online. I believe I got that from either the National Association of Home Builders or the National Association of Realtors. I'm thinking it's home builders. We also have a copy of the reporting of opportunity um, for that access to credit for white households in those affordable areas? Interesting. Hoarding of opportunity of white households. Um, it certainly could be. In fact, uh, I would argue that it probably has to do with just overall disparities in opportunity, both in employment and other kinds of uh, markets in those areas. And so it's this kind of omitted variable thing that's going on uh, that the areas that um, have low housing opportunity, low, low affordability, also have higher unemployment, various other kinds of issues that tend to have a higher impact on sort of black populations. Uh, so the point is that there are these other things going on. And what sort of bugs me and what we see published in the media and talked about in the popular press and the business and policy space, you know, people show these disparities and then they have these really overly simplistic explanations for why they occur. And I think that that has harmed us, those of us who are interested in informing public policy and helping to, to develop uh, and improve public policies because the explanations are not necessarily, they're not straightforward. Um, it's not just income. So this diagram, and uh, I have to thank uh, my good friend, uh, Morgan Green for uh, her artistic development of this. Um, this diagram is intended to kind of summarize the reasons behind the black home ownership gap. Uh, the black white home ownership gap. So the way to read this is to kind of look at the elbows. We have a, a history of racial segregation, redlining, and restrictive zoning. As a result of that, we have segregated neighborhoods that have differential outcomes for their residents, including in black neighborhoods, we have uh, fewer educational opportunities and employment opportunities, which leads to sort of lower incomes. At the same time, for even homeowners in Black neighborhoods, they face lower home values, higher property taxes in a relative sense, and therefore lower returns to homeownership than similarly situated uh, white households. Lower wealth. Um, as a result of these sort of lower incomes and lower wealth, these families' uh, households are more likely to face rejection in the mortgage market. Why? Because of things like higher loan-to-value ratios, that is, less, less, uh, fewer assets to use for down payments, uh, higher debt burdens, 
um, for you know any number of reasons, but uh, that are that are, can be traced to uh, fewer assets. And then lower FICO scores, and we'll talk about that in a second. But that has to do with uh, the fact that up till until very recently, the way that FICO and other credit scores uh, were designed, they were based on sort of traditional forms of credit, you know, car loans, credit cards. And up until very recently, about a third of Black and Latino households actually didn't have credit files that included traditional forms of credit. So they uh, couldn't have FICO scores, and that in and of itself became a barrier to access to mortgage credit. So then what happens? Enter the mortgage market, higher chance of rejection, um, end up using FHA and VA mortgages, nothing wrong with that. Uh, we have our former FHA commissioner right here in the room, so I have to be careful about what I say about the FHA. Um, but FHA provides many, many opportunities for people who would not be able to qualify or afford conventional loans. Um, but over time, it costs more to be in the FHA market uh, because of the mortgage insurance premiums that are charged. Um, these factors, since they are used to quantify default risk, mean that these borrowers find themselves in a higher risk category and have to pay more for mortgage credit via loan level price adjustments. Um, they, these borrowers also are less likely to refinance into lower rates. So that means paying more interest over time, accumulating less equity over time. So let me go back to the other side <laughs> before I forget this. So this is what's going on in the mortgage market. On the property side, you have a history of predatory lending not just in leading up to the 2008 subprime crisis, but predatory lending practices that manifest themselves in other ways, uh, which uh, tend to be um, more likely to target Black households. But we also have uh, restrictive zoning practices that started out uh, being put in place by the federal government and, and its policies way back in the day. I'll talk about that in a second. All of these things taken together are what are factors that explain the home ownership rate and the reason why we haven't been able to make any real significant changes to that since 1968 Fair Housing Act, which was designed in part to try to eradicate uh, these problems. So this is the model. This is a model that I drew, um, and this is the the this is the way that I think. Real simple. Okay. Oh, Go back. Slides. So why different the property tax? Because the property tax always based on the location and the uh, property, and you know any relative with the tenants, ownerships, and others, so quite different. That's an excellent question, and it is not straightforward. The answer is not straightforward. So property taxes tend to be higher in a relative sense because property taxes are a function of the tax assessment, which in a given city, say, goes up at, go up at the same rate. If you look at the rate of appreciation of homes in minority neighborhoods versus predominantly white neighborhoods, the rate of appreciation in these minority neighborhoods is lower. But property tax assessments are going up at the same rate. So the ratio of the money that you're earning on your, the appreciation that you're earning on your house um, as a resident of a, of a predominantly uh, sort of black or, or Latino neighborhood um, is uh, not going up at the same rate that tax assessments are. So this really is, so that's why it's a little complicated. I'm probably not explaining it very well, but really it is the ratio of the earnings on the house to the 
taxes that are levied on the house that are different, that are um, place black households at a disadvantage. I'm curious because I'm not sure how it works in the U.S., but don't cities usually like have differentiated property taxes depending, or is it usually a fixed uh, property tax? It varies. It varies. Uh, there's also so there's an interesting paper on this that uh, was done based on Chicago areas. Um, I cannot remember the authors, but it definitely was out of Chicago, and then. Um, it was sort of covered, I think, in the New York Times and, and people were sort of talking about it. Uh, the other thing that they found was that uh, there were fewer tax assessment appeals in Black neighborhoods. So not only were people being sort of charged relatively more, because if you think that, you know, the appreciate, if, if, the, if there's sort of one rate uh, that's being charged, people do have the opportunity to appeal, but that costs money. You often need a lawyer and you have to, you know, take time off and deal with uh, government, local government bureaucracy. Um, there are some places that have uh, finer areas and they do tax assessment increases sort of better. In the digital age, with things like you know, Redfin and Zillow, there's actually no reason why uh, there has to be sort of one fixed amount for an entire area anyway. Uh, it's just that they've not sort of updated the technology with the data that are available. But in some areas, it's not the case in every, in some areas, they do more sort of fine tuned tax assessment um, uh, calibration. Okay. So here's my simple model. Uh, actually, I had drawn this on a napkin and try to use uh, technology to make it look a little bit less napkin-y and then I couldn't pull it off. But the point of this is just to show that the history of redlining and discrimination affects each of the aspects of mortgage underwriting. So each of the set of criteria that are used to approve or deny mortgages or evaluate people for mortgage credit, uh, each of them can be traced to history of discrimination uh, and or redlining. And so these taken together limit access to mortgage credit. That translates into lower home ownership rates. So that part we know. The other thing I wanna argue though, is that there's also a direct effect of this history of discrimination on home ownership opportunities and home ownership. And that through a process of cumulative disadvantage, so it occurs, you know, it starts here, it affects these, it affects this, that affects that, but the direct effect occurs because of a kind of chilling effect, see, ice. Um, that is that people in the market, you know, consumers observe this, this home ownership gap. They're aware of it. They talk to people. They know people who've been rejected. They know people who, uh, you know, lost their homes to foreclosure during during the financial crisis. Uh, they know people who've had to pay uh, extra. Uh, fees uh, for to get mortgages and go through all sorts of other hoops. And so between that and the supply constraints that are exacerbated by segregation, by, you know, sort of racially segregated neighborhoods, you see this direct effect of discrimination that occurs, um, that, that affects home ownership as, as well. So and all of these things are going on sort of at the same time. And I think that the models that we have used to try to understand these usually don't take this sort of multi-stage approach over time. They usually take a, well, here we are, here are these, you know, here's a FICO score, here's uh, the amount of cash the borrower has, uh, here's the value of the home relative to the other values in the homes in the neighborhood. So we're gonna, 
decide whether or not to approve a loan and how much we're going to charge. But if we don't start sort of back here and then start thinking about some of these other demand affecting issues, then we really don't fully have an understanding of what's going on in the market. So I'll take a step back. I know you've talked quite a bit about redlining in this class uh, in the past and done some readings. I thought it would be fun just to take a few excerpts from the 1938 FHA underwriting guide. Now you are all really young, a lot younger than me. Uh, and so 1938 probably sounds like a long, long time ago, but in 1938, my mother was 10. So it, <laughs> From her perspective, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Uh, it's a couple of generations, but time moves quickly. And in the 1938 FHA underwriting guide, they have uh, very specific racial occupancy designations and codes that they give the underwriters because this is what they were, they were to use when they went out to uh, evaluate whether or not FHA was going to in insure a loan. And it says things like areas surrounding a location are investigated to determine whether incompatible racial and social groups are present for the purpose of making a prediction regarding the probability of the location being invaded by such groups. Uh, families enjoy social relationships with other families whose education, abilities, mode of living, and racial characteristics are similar to their own. They talked extensively about uh, restrictive covenants, covenants that local area jurisdictions have in place um, and, and encouraged these covenants um, because they should strengthen and supplement zoning ordinances and to be really effective should include the provisions listed below, including pro prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by for the race for which they are, were intended. I don't know what race, I, I don't, I, anyway. Um, the borrower who acquires property for occupancy in a location inhabited by a class or race of people that may impair his interest in the property and thereby affect his motivation should be ascribed a lower rating. So thank goodness for progress that we don't have these uh, kinds of instructions in any of our uh, guidelines in the mortgage market uh, at this time. But there's but the effects, just like the effects of the divided cemetery, uh, can still be observed. Uh, there's still language, for example, that talks about character of borrowers and trying to find proxies for character. And actually, a credit score was intended to be a measure of a person's character. Well, the truth is, the reason, the the major reason why people fail to build. Fail, fail to pay their bills on time. Now, it has nothing to do with whether they're good people or not, but usually has to do with some unforeseen medical expense or other kind of loss of employment, uh, some other kind of thing that is outside of their control. Uh, yet the goal is really to capture people's character. And here we see a link between character and a person's racial or ethnic background. So uh, the, the uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation instituted um, these redlining maps, which were color coded. And you know, uh, I'll show you one in a second. I think I skipped, yeah. Um, so the Homeowners Lo Loan Corporation's policy kind of, policies kind of fed into the Federal Housing Administration uh, once they got rid of the Hulk but it was established in the New Deal, uh, as you know, to stabilize the mortgage market. And so what they did was grade neighborhoods. They had these color-coded maps of neighborhoods, and they used those to evaluate credit risk. Um, they looked at legitimate factors like the age of the housing stock and the condition and access to transportation and other kinds of amenities, 
but they also looked at the socioeconomic and racial composition of the neighborhoods, uh, I mean, of the, of the residents. Uh, and so here's a map of the Boston area, and you can see where um, the, the red was a hazardous and blue was um, kind of desirable and green was the best. So based on what you know of the Boston area now, um, does this map look anything like the map, a map that you would see today? I can't see them. I, so, so we just have to kind of <laughs> overlay what we know of sort of where we are. Um, or sort of where some central area might be. The uh, Boston map is actually an interesting one because the top of that big red block is the south end. Okay. Um, so that's the south end going down into probably roughly Nubian Square. Um, and I think that's South Boston. I think that's the South Boston waterfront off to the right. Um, not sure what the big red block shed at the bottom of the center bottom is. Um, hmm. Yeah, and I think I think the red space on the far left. This one. Yeah, I believe that's kind of Nonantum, which was the historic black. Community in Newton, along where the those of you who know the, the city that's about where the mass pike is run through. In fact, that's where the mass pike runs through there. So it's interesting because you know this map was drawn and color coded back in you know 1930 or sometime around then. Usually, when you look at them, you can see that the same sort of you can sort of see what they were getting at, and you can still see the effects to this day of uh, those red line zones. So there have been a number of studies that look at the effects of past redlining on conditions of the residents and neighborhoods today. A number of them have come out of you know, the public health and uh, sociology. Um, so here's just a quick review of some of the ones I, I've, I've seen that past hope grades and segregation factors explain 25% of the variation in current poverty rates, 23% of economic inequality, 38% of SNAP usage, SNAP usage, SNAP is food assistance uh, for low-income families, uh, half of the difference in median household income from neighborhood to neighborhood can be traced to prior hope grades. Um, uh, reduction in community statistical area life expectancy can be explained by these uh, past maps uh, and, and neighborhood divisions. Uh, Socioeconomic development of children, preterm births, they're actually hotter. Uh, Hulk areas that were designated red actually have uh, as much as seven degrees uh, 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 Celsius elevated land surface temperatures. Why? Because they have more uh, concrete cover and you know fewer trees, um, concrete, cement, uh, et cetera. Um, less coverage by tree canopy, more asphalt, all of that. So that's just an in sort of the kind of public health space. Uh, in terms of the housing market, uh, areas that were on the lower graded side of the Hulk boundaries have uh, show a marked increase in racial segregation in subsequent decades, a long run decline in home ownership, home values, and credit scores, a 5% uh, decrease in 1990 house prices, after controlling for various other factors that you might expect to see, uh, an increase in vacant houses and a decrease in owner occupation, um, and 
in a recent study uh, I've been working on with my uh, Urban Institute colleagues, Michael Neal and Lena Zhu, a greater likelihood of automated valuation model bias and automation, auto, automated valuation models are what is current, what are currently replacing uh, in-person appraisals. And they've been sort of positioned as a possible solution to disparities in appraisals that human appraisers actually uh, have uh, been shown to produce in some cases. Um, but our research shows that uh, they still pick up past redlining effects. So that's, those are all sort of historic factors. In terms of redlining today, you know, we don't have maps, Well, we have maps and we just talked about that, but we don't act on maps in that way. Uh, many of the, these practices have been prohibited by a number of fair housing laws. Uh, which is great, um, but we now find ourselves in the digital age facing another kind of redlining, uh, and that is uh, algorithmic bias. Anybody want to tell us about algorithmic bias or some examples? Doesn't have to be in the housing market either. Um, there are a lot of variables that are proxies for other things. So depending on the data that you have available to train an algorithm, um, you can ingrain the biases that exist in the data you collect. One common example is in predictive policing. We over-police areas of Black and Hispanic communities in the United States. So algorithms um, are biased towards predicting crimes in those areas, whereas we do not have data available because we don't have police predominantly white neighborhoods. Thank you. Perfect. Anyone else? Um, yeah, one thing as well on top of that is like the lack, when there's like a lack of data or missing data for certain populations, then there's sort of like an inability to assess these people. And so sort of those folks get completely kind of like erased from the, the pool of like potential folks because previous data has not been collected about them or about yeah, absolutely. Um, another good example, uh, and one that definitely applies in the context of, say, credit scoring. You know, an example I talked about earlier, in which you had, you know, 30% of Black households that didn't have traditional forms of credit. And then you've got a credit scoring companies who are calibrating predictive models in the absence of 30% of that population you would imagine that they would have some, some biased results. They're taking some steps to try to correct that now. But this is sort of where the redlining focus has surrounded. Uh, there was a case against Facebook. Uh, Facebook was charged by HUD for violating the Fair Housing Act because they were allowing advertisers to use race, uh, disability status, uh, age, and some other factors I can't remember um, to target prospective customers with ad mortgage ads. And they settled that case. Uh, and uh, part of the settlement was something that, you know, I still don't understand. Uh, doesn't seem to make sense. You know, my former life, I was a marketing professor. So the way that, so, you know, sort of advertising and marketing communications are something that, you know, I thought I got, but. Now the way it works, and instead of letting a mortgage company target ads based on these demographic characteristics, they put all the ads in a database that you're allowed to search. Who is spending time searching for an ad? Why would you do that? That's just a very strange uh, approach to, to dealing with, with that problem. But at any rate, it's settled and, and that's what happened. But you can imagine in the digital world that probably any number of concerns that we should have about uh, the adoption of big data and the application of these uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning because of the data that they're able to access. And one of the concerns is that we don't always know what data are being accessed. 
Um, and we also don't know how those algorithms work necessarily, unless you're the developer sort of by definition, you, you can, and even the developers after a while lose control over what models are doing because that's what machine learning is supposed to do. So there's a lot of concern about the uh, adoption of those technologies. Okay, so as I mentioned, access to mortgage credit is um, determined by the three C's and past racism and discrimination affect each of those three C's. And so to summarize kind of how these differences manifest themselves, here's a profile of an average black new homeowner versus an average white new homeowner. Um, and these are a few years dated. I think right now you could probably add about uh, uh, hundred thousand dollars to to each of these, um, but you see that you know the average black home buyer is buying a smaller home, right? For because of affordability disparity, so that makes sense. Um, but are more likely to obtain an FHA or VA loan than conventional. Tend to have higher debt to income ratios uh, relative to average white borrowers tend to have lower FICO scores for the reasons I described earlier, uh, even though we're hoping that changes, um, tend to have higher than average loan to value ratios because of lower down payments, uh, so lower equity up front, and are more likely to be denied mortgage credit, uh, at least um, uh, according to the Home, Mor Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. So, these are sort of representing the three C's and the outcomes that you, you see are in whether or not the loans get originated and what they look like. Another way to look at the three C's. So the, these numbers are based on renter populations between the ages of 25 and 65. So, you know, in the range that you would expect to see first time home buyers. Question. For the best previous, uh, actually, the average of the new home price is the same location, the average of different location. Yeah, this is just everywhere. Uh, this is just, this is the average across the US. But yes, the locations are different. Yes, I know. Because like this model, if the same location and the same market, the different black and the white may be that price. Best. But if the different location, maybe like some village and some sub market, the price always lower than the downtown. So you know, I don't know. It's an it's I mean it's an excellent point. You've made a couple of points in there that are important. One we're comparing apples to oranges because we're assuming that these properties are in the same location, but they actually are not. We know they are not because of the patterns of segregation in most of the areas where sort of black households are con concentrated. So they really aren't. So not only are they, you know, they, they could very well be the same kinds of properties. Ed and I had this extended conversation about this yesterday, but maybe, but probably not um, because the neighborhoods are different. And so the characteristics of the property within those neighborhoods vary. It turns out that black neighborhoods tend to have older homes. So the homes tend to be older. And again, they tend to be concentrated in uh, lower value areas. Going back to redlining, these are areas that um, so are, are sort of less desirable for all sorts of other reasons. You know, they tend to be located closer to sort of factories and polluted areas um, and less green space and park lands and, and that kind of thing. And that those, those are objective factors that actually play into the values and prices of homes. So they actually aren't the same, but there've been all these recent accounts in the popular press in which the same house was appraised by the same appraiser when the appraiser thought the owners were black and came back 
and the, you know, they got another appraisal and pretended like the house was owned by white people and the appraised value went up by, I think in the Baltimore example, it was $200,000. It was something really, really, really crazy. Uh, and the way that happens is because of the comparables, because the way that appraisals work, one of the key factors is what other homes in that same neighborhood, how, what, what, were, what was the value of those transactions, you know, recent transactions? And of course, if there's correlation within neighborhoods, then you're going to um, have some, they, they get some, they have some choices over what they use as a basis of comparison. And that's where the problems sort of come in. Um, Appraisal and appraisers, when you talk to learn that even though like they come in and said to upgrade above the contract price, that there's still so much like appraisal of devaluation. And going back to your point about algorithmic bias, I've read some articles about like an automated appraisal process to get rid of some of that sensitivity. And I'm curious um, if you know about like the recent evidence on if that's also introducing like more algorithmic bias instead of like, human bias. Um, yeah. So there's uh, our own, my own work that I work, I call it my own. It's not my own. I, I'm, I'm working. I've um, attached myself to a project that the Housing Finance Policy Center uh, is working on. Uh, again, Michael Neal and Lena Zhu are doing some work on the errors that are made by an automated valuation model. And the error is defined by a disparity, a difference between uh, the proportional difference between uh, the house price that with its ultimate transaction price and what the AVM produced as the value. And it turns out that in formerly redlined areas, there tends to be uh, a higher magnitude of this error, which means that they may be solving some of the problems that you know the human error problems but they have their own kinds of errors it all comes down to the data right that that they're using as a basis there have been some other studies uh the best of which i've seen was done by uh at freddie mac uh our former colleague michael bradley and his team have done a really really impressive job of very carefully and methodically uh, looking at um, this, this the, the incidence of sort of appraisal valuation errors, and they look at both human appraisals and these automated kinds of appraisals, and they do find evidence that um, both households owned by Black people and Black neighborhoods, uh, there are definitely disparities in the way that they're treated. Um, the the research is so thorough and the data sets are so large that it's really almost undisputable that, that this effect occurs. You know, as you might imagine, when this first hit the popular media, there were a couple of studies and they got that, that came out showing evidence of appraisal bias. And they, of course, got you know, challenged by you know, the academic world because that's all we do. We sit around and we say, well, they didn't do this and they didn't consider that and they didn't control for this and blah, blah, blah. And so what that did was spark a flurry of other studies using different data sets and different time frames and different specifications. And so what we have now are, you know, a body of literature that confirms even the naysayers, even the studies that tried to suggest that there was no such thing as systemic bias in appraisals have actually found bias in appraisals. So it is at this point an empirical generalization. Now it's time for us to try to think about what we can do about it. Uh, over the weekend, and you can easily put as your objective function to have equal errors across that map that you showed. Uh, the computer will spit out a perfectly decent model the next day. Why, why is it going to take five years? The, in fact, people the, in the fintech world, that's what they like to do. They like to sit around and find cool ways to do things like, let's use machine learning to undo the effects of past discrimination and, and, and redlining and racism. 
the problem is the adoption, you know, to get the industry, and by this, I don't mean just the appraisal industry, but I mean, you know, investors who rely on these valuations because they need to know, you know, what's their exposure and how much they stand to make. And it just takes so long. It is, it's, you would not believe how much effort and how many high level people it takes to make one tiny little change in the way in, in, a, in one rule that that sort of governs the mortgage market. So I think that it'll happen at some point, but what would have to happen from a policy perspective is that the sort of the regulators uh, sort of an investment community would have to decide that they absolutely want to remove these effects from their models period, end of story, and that they would have an alternative way of valuing properties that would get them the same result, which is, you know, their money. And I can't think through what that alternative is. Um, but but, but I, it could be done. Um, it, it could be done. Anything can be done with these models and all these data. Uh, it could definitely be done, but somebody has to require that this policy issue gets addressed in this way. Okay, this is, you know, nothing surprising here, so I won't spend a lot of time in it, but here, uh, what we tried to do is sort of look at sort of the differential in renters that would be, you know, they, they meet some minimum um, income requirement, they would actually be able, based on their income, to qualify to for a $250,000 home um, based on available assets. And these are sort of rough estimates. But in terms of meeting all of the requirements, the debt to income ratio, the uh, down payment requirements, you know, 3% roughly, uh, the credit requirements, that is, you know, FICO score over, I don't know, 620, uh, which means, you know, no significant, no 60-day late payments over a two-year period. Um, we have, you know, 16% of white renters who meet that criteria compared to four and four for Black and Hispanic renters. So the imposition of the standard underwriting requirements because they don't account for the effects of past discrimination and racism will continue to be a barrier. And the only way around that, right, is to change those requirements. Black and Latino borrowers are more likely to obtain FHA and uh, Veterans Administration insured loans. Um, FHA and VA have been carrying the water in the mortgage market since the financial crisis. Before the financial crisis, the conventional mortgage market actually did a much better job of serving um, Black and Hispanic home buyers, both in terms of home purchases and refinance loans. So I don't know what happened. Ed, I blame you. You were at Freddie Mac at the time. I don't know what you did, but um, somehow or another, the share of loans in the con conventional market plummeted to Black and Hispanic borrowers. And he says nothing. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is actually for one of uh, Ed's papers. Uh, Ed and uh, our former colleague, Michelle Aronowitz and Jung Choi at the Urban Institute did a uh, really nice uh, analysis of how much more Black people pay for home ownership, largely as a result of being in the FHA market. Per year, $743 more in interest, $550 more in insurance premiums, $390 more in property taxes, turns out to be over $13,000 more over the life of the loan, and $67,000 in lost retirement savings because that's a lack of sort of equity accumulated. $60,000, $67,000 is about what the medium, median family income is for a family of four in the US, something like that. It might be a shade over 70, but it's in that range. So these decisions 
have real, on the part of the market, have real consequences. But what are some of the solutions that are currently being kicked around? You know, the Biden administration announced mere moments after his inauguration that they were going to address the racial wealth gap via the uh, trying to eradicate the racial homeownership gap. And since then, a number of sort of positive changes have occurred. One, and like this just happened, the uh, FHFA, which uh, regulates the federal home loan banks, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, who are in conservatorship, um, they gave Freddie and Fannie the permission to waive loan level price adjustments for low and moderate income borrowers. So this was huge. I was super geeked about this. I won't take credit for it, but it's something that I told them that they should do early on and they did it. Now, I don't know whether they know that I told them that. I don't know whether you know, um, they actually read these comment letters that get submitted, but at any rate, uh, it's happened um, and it's a great, change. So loan level price adjustments are those sort of additional basis points added to the interest rate because of underlying risk characteristics of the mortgage. And historically, they were based on credit score and um, loan to value. So if you had a low down payment, you paid a higher interest rate via these loan level price adjustments. If you had a lower credit score, you paid a higher interest rate. One of the problems, and what I showed in the pr prior chart, is that those tend to be correlated. So a lot of Black and Hispanic borrowers find themselves in both of those categories. So what happens when you add up these loan level pricing adjustments, the, in the conventional market, the interest rate ends up being significantly higher because of this than it would be under FHA. So people end up in the FHA market, which, as I mentioned, as we just showed, uh, has its own costs, additional costs over time. So Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae imposed these. They just decided to uh, relax these for low and moderate income home buyers, uh, first time home buyers, excuse me, just first time home buyers, which is great, except that remember, I started out by saying that the black home ownership gap is not just simply an income problem. The other thing that they did, which I still can't believe, they added back the debt to income ratio. And so the people who might have benefited from them relaxing the loan level price adjustments because of credit score or uh, loan to value now are gonna get penalized because of their DTI ratio. I don't know what they, well, I know what they were thinking. Um, they're nervous. They're, they're getting worried about the economy. You know, everybody's like, oh, 2008, we're gonna, you know, go back to, to that. No, we're not. You know, we're not in the subprime world. That's not what's going on. Um, they're, you know, well, uh, capital, this is, this is not an issue, but they've decided to make it an issue. Um, it is political. Uh, and so there's that. So, um, but they're at least thinking about the fact that, Average pricing, that is, everybody pays very close to the same price for the same mortgage pro product, is more fair. It, it expands opportunity for others. And the truth is, um, the risk of default and losses is extremely well managed by these organizations and has been since it actually was before the, the subprime mortgage crisis. That was kind of a separate set of bad decisions. But in terms of, you know, sort of their regular everyday mortgage business, the, the, the risks are neg ne negligible. So I already kind of talked about this, so I'll skip it. Skip it um, only to mention that uh, this was, uh, these data came for, were a couple of years ago, but between credit invisible, which are people who don't have traditional forms of credit and people who are unscorable, that is they have so few traditional forms of credit or activity that they can't be
be scored by the credit scoring algorithm. You had you know, 28% of black households. So couldn't have FICO scores under you know, the prior model. And so this was a huge problem. And so what's been, what's happening now, uh, thanks to uh, the adoption, finally adoption of the latest version of the FICO scoring model, which took, how many years did that take Ed? Like 10 years maybe? Took about 10 years. Well, so how long does it take for Apple to come out with a new iPhone? maybe 18 months, it took 10 years to go from FICO 10, FICO 9 to FICO 10. So your earlier question, Ed, about, you know, why can't we get the appraisal systems to work better? It's gonna take a while. The greatest thing about this new version of FICO is it allows for rental payments and certain utility and telecom payments to be included and scored in the same way that traditional lines of credit like credit cards and car loans would be. And so this in and of itself will reduce one of the key barriers to mortgage access. Another potential solution is the special purpose credit program. Special purpose credit program is a provision in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act that actually allows lending to occur on the basis of race. So the whole purpose of uh, ECOA and Fair Housing Act is to eliminate race as a factor in lending decisions. But they had this they knew at the time of enacting ECOA that there will be there should should be allowances for groups of people who have been subject to disadvantage in credit markets in the past. And in these cases, if a lender can prove that um, this particular group in their com or their community has been disadvantaged or discriminated against in the past in terms of access to credit, they can actually offer them some relaxed underwriting standards. They can do things like waive down payment requirements, waive FICO score requirements, uh, allow for down payment grants to be provided by other sources, say nonprofits. Uh, they can um, you know, do all kinds of things that don't necessarily line up with the sort of traditional underwriting model. And as recently as last summer, some of the big banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, there have been others have announced special purpose credit programs. So you might've seen it in the news. Of course, they started out with some kind of misleading, um, misleading headlines like no down payment mortgages offered. Well, it's only no down payment uh, up to $15,000. So they would allow a $15,000 grant to be made by some third party, say nonprofit or local government housing authority. Well, now we come back to the one point, if you remember nothing about what we've talked about today, there's just not enough of a supply of homes in that are affordable. And when I say affordable, I don't mean affordable in some kind of, kind of special kind of way. I mean affordable for people who earn 120 or 150% of their local area median. Uh, far too few have homes that, are, that they can actually afford to buy because of what's happened with house prices and certainly what's happened with interest rates just in the past six months. So the special purpose credit program, while well-intentioned, may have very little to no impact because think about what markets you're talking about where you can literally get have, a, where 15% would pay the, $15,000 would pay the entire down payment. Not many. Uh, they're just not that many units. Um, I forget what the number is, but there's some, millions of missing 
housing units that are needed to be able to actually close uh, or narrow the home ownership gap. So you're, you made a point earlier, so I wanna get to that. Always about the previous slide. About the Bank of America uh, to offer zero down payment mortgage to black debt. This policy may be unfair to other groups. So uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the fair? Because if, um, if the financial institution gives the same factors to elevate the um, landlord and all the home ownership uh, standards that maybe the gap will become larger. That if the financial institution gives the different factors to different groups, so maybe it's not unfair, but it's mm -hmm. unfair. So what is the real to any Are you a lawyer? <laughs> uh, I'm asking because your point is well taken. So what I believe you were pointing out is that uh, other groups may feel that this is discriminatory because it is to offer sort of special criteria to a group of people uh, ostensibly because of, of the past discrimination. This pro these programs have yet to be tested in court. And even though the regulators have all said that special purpose credit programs are legal, they've yet to be tested in court. And you know how things work around here. It's got to be tested in court. Um, depending, I, you can just imagine the politics. Uh, it sounds like many other kinds of um, minority-oriented uh, programs that we've had both in small business lending and in education and in other industries that have not been able to consistently stand up in court. So we may very well have some problems. We have a question here. I also, anyone online, now is a good time to make your questions because we're about to wrap up. Yeah, I have a follow-up question to that, and I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on this idea of discriminatory kind of pr uh, practice process in regards to policy, but then the tension around, like, if we take a stance around equity, like, as an equitable approach to address such gaps, and so whether you've had thoughts on this, um, was, and I think I read this in my reflection around targeted approaches to addressing, you know, um, such disparities and whether you had some books on that. That's a tough question. I keep forgetting I'm at MIT where, you know, these kinds of thoughts. Um, there is a tension. And in my personal opinion, until there is a stated commitment on the part of the government to advance equity by taking active steps which sound and look like reparations. I'm always afraid to use that word because you can get kicked out of rooms when you talk about reparations, but that's really what it is. Uh, they just manifest itself differently. So taking active steps saying that we acknowledge the effects of redlining and discrimination in these communities. And so we are going to waive loan level price adjustments. We are going to, um, have streamlined refinance options so that people are able to sort of lower the cost of home ownership over time. These are active steps that require a commitment on the part of the federal government to actually actively, affirmatively make changes. And without that, you know, I won't be here in another 20 years, but 20 years from now, there'll be somebody standing up talking about you know, the underpinnings of the racial home ownership gap, just like there was 20 years ago and 20 years before that. Thank you so much again. Um, my question is it's related to what you were just saying about reparations and also um, just going back to sort of thinking about home ownership as a core component of wealth building overall. Um, 
And I was curious because I've come across sort of different research and um, articles around kind of thinking presently and ahead to how much home ownership will continue to be like part of um, wealth building in that way and thinking, you know, certainly historically how much that's been the case, especially for white generation after generation, um, but not in the same way for households of color. Um, and so I was, I was, my question um, is just sort of how that enters into your research, thinking about wealth in the future, like defining that more broadly and how other forms of wealth building um, are showing up in like contemporary, like households, socioeconomic status and what you expect in the future. Wow, another tough question. Um, I think about this a lot because, you know, we probably place too much emphasis on home ownership, but that's because of the kind of shell game that has been set up by this sort of complicated market structure with the primary and the secondary market and the tax code. You know, everybody's kind of colluded to keep this engine running. But when it's all said and done, it's kind of like a funny money. Uh, it's a shell game. It's it's musical chairs, and um, there there's got to be some other way. You know, people talk about sort of access to sort of small independent businesses. That's great, but it turns out that relies on the mortgage market because most people fund their small business investments with home equity. So. I'd be happy to learn of a solution. People talk about things like the stock market. Well, the last thing we want people to do is take their money and go picking stocks. Um, you know, that, that's not safe. Now there are ways to sort of manage portfolios and manage risks and, and, and all that. But, you know, you got a whole MBA program down here of people who are going straight to Wall Street to, you know, figure out how to do that and nobody's nailed it yet. So you certainly don't want lay people out there trying to figure out how to create their own portfolios. So I would love for there to be some opportunity, some alternatives. Um, that said, you know, people, people need places to live. I think we have one last question from the audience and then I'll ask you to sort of do a quick summary and we'll fall. So thank you. David. Yeah, we've had we've, uh, just a really terrific um, set of questions, and somebody just put in a note saying, "Tough house, brilliant audience, super good questions." So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what what does success look like? So you you said you know you're not going to be here in twenty years, but when you're um, almost equivalent is here in twenty years, giving the the talk that says we 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 address this problem, what would what would that what would success look like? To me, success would look like a narrowed, if not fully eliminated, home ownership gap, moving towards a wealth gap. 20 years is too soon to close the wealth gap, but we certainly could do something about the home ownership gap um, between now and then. Um, but the first thing that has to happen is we've got to have some houses for, I mean, we can do all of this stuff. You know, I probably spend too much time talking about mortgages just because it's what I've studied for so long. But the truth is, if what I really should be studying are supply issues, you know, we all need to be we're thinking about how we can get away from this notion that everybody needs to live in a four bedroom house on half an acre and try to figure out some alternatives so that we can have more housing units for people to buy. And then we'll just have to deal with what happens in terms of you know, appreciation and wealth building, because a lot of this is built on that, the kind of trade up model is what is keeping, has kept the system going uh, the way that it is. And so we don't have the starter homes for new entrants to, to the housing market. And it, without that being fixed, there's really, you know, the rest of the stuff is, is, it's just, you know, people sitting around in Washington um, putting things on, pulling bullet points in their resume. So I, I will do a little math for you since this is MIT. To close the gap in 10 years, we need something like an additional incremental 5,000 Black families every week uh, purchasing a home. Um, 
and the, you know, that uh, packet puts in perspective, some of these programs will give you an extra few hundred, but it really does take a big pivot uh, to close that within 10 years, 20 years, you might time too, but uh, you really do have to make fundamental changes. Uh, Vanessa, I would uh, like to thank you for uh, traveling. I'd like to thank you. All the way from uh, Washington. Uh, we are going, I think, to wrap up and let's give a big uh, round of applause. And then we have to have Thank you all. It's been awesome. I think that's a wrap. That's bouncing. We're not being recorded.